Hey, good morning, everyone. Marty Mazzura here. Friday, the 16th of June, 2023. This is your weekly economic update. I have a few things I want to share with you today. As usual, we'll talk briefly about our score, share a handful of inputs. I want to share with you two or three charts that come from our overall assessment of financial conditions. And then I want to share a bit from my notes little bit on the consumer and then run through some other charts from some other sources that I think are instructive about the state of current conditions. So on your screen there is our graph of our PWA index that has been live since July of 2017. We back tested it a ways back as well. Last week we ticked just up two points, still firmly in a scenario where conditions favor recession in the foreseeable future as opposed to continued expansion. Retail sales came out this last week and they were up a little bit. They were actually expected to decline, but they actually ticked up a little bit. Still, the trajectory is not good relative to its signaling about the economy. Every week we show you the Red Book survey and that continues to plummet and we're in that space that tends to occupy recessions or real close to it. Certainly the trajectory is pointing in that direction. I'll talk a little bit more about retail sales in the end. Consumer Confidence, University of Michigan's came out today and looking at the report, definitely improving, but still, as you can see on the chart here, still at historically low levels. And again, just reading from the brief narrative in the report, consumer sentiment lifted 8% in June, reaching its highest level in four months, reflecting greater optimism as inflation eased and policymakers resolved the debt ceiling crisis. The outlook over the economy surged 28% over the short run and 14% over the long run. Sentiment is now 28% above the historic low from a year ago and so on. As it stands though, sentiment remains low by historical standards as income expectations soften. The majority of consumers still expect difficult times in the economy over the next year. Their inflation outlook in the near term dropped to 3.3% in June from 4.2% in May. Uh, it's the lowest since March of 2021. Long-term inflation stayed the same at 3% annual. And remember, the Fed's target is 2%. Initial jobless claims continue to, to tick higher and continue to move in a fashion that they tend to move leading into recessions. The NFIB Small Business Survey came out this last week. And as you can see, overall optimism remains quite subdued, quite low. Hiring plans, however, interestingly, picked up a little bit. And CapEx plans actually jumped significantly. This actually is what led to just the slight increase in the overall score of our index. Industrial production actually ticked down on a month-over-month -month basis, just a slight anemic year-over-year -year increase. Again, that's consistent with our go-forward economic thesis. Commercial and industrial loans continue to come down in very recession-like trajectory here. The CPI numbers came out on Wednesday and as we suggested they would, they continue to drop. Base effects virtually demanded it. Plus we're seeing a weakening, a weakening economy folks so that leads to lower inflation and I happen to be in the camp kind of like the market is in this sense in that I really don't think there are rate increases from the Fed in our future. There's just nothing in terms of what I'm looking at in the overall macro that says that they shouldn't be done at this point. I think the economy is slowing. Inflation definitely is coming off the boil. However, they came out very hawkish in their commentary. Although they didn't hike, they did pause, but the dot plot and the language was changed. It was where previously they hinted that they're going to pause and wait and see if they need to tighten further. This one said we're going, we are pausing and we're going to wait to see the extent to which we're going to be tightening. 
But I'll say it again, the, the data as we see it suggests a market slowdown in the economy coming and therefore a market slowdown in inflation. However, there is one caveat, and I've made this point several times last month or two, and that is the second half of the year base effects are not good relative to trying to keep inflation down. Therefore, all things being equal, you would see higher relative prints, unlike what we just got and unlike what we're going to get for the June number. The equity market continues to defy the Fed. So it could have been them trying to get this market a little bit under control because, you know, rising equity markets are akin to easing financial conditions and more inflationary pressures going forward. So that could be a concern of theirs, theirs as well, is that the equity market doesn't take us seriously and we need to talk it back a little bit. Our view is the equity market isn't going to need the Fed to talk it down if indeed we are going to enter a recession. And looking at where earnings expectations are, stock prices are not discounting a recession in the foreseeable future. Also, the producer price index came out and that actually went down a third of a percent on a month over month basis, which is exactly what I'm talking about. Copper, on the other hand, you know, an inflationary force in and of itself, is bouncing nicely right here. Now, a lot of optimism coming back or promises from China that uh, they're disappointed in the first half results and they are pulling out a few stops to try to inspire some growth and just kind of in a knee-jerk way, the world sees China stimulus as bullish copper. Maybe some other things in there as well. And, you know, it's quite the decline. Um, I think you want to own copper long term. But if we're right on our recession call, here's here's the look of copper during you know the COVID recession. I could take you back as well. Then it wouldn't surprise us to see copper, you know, turn back down and even get lower before it ultimately finds a durable bottom. So that's it for the inputs that affect our PWA index. The inputs that affect our financial stress index are things like senior loan officer survey results. And this is incredibly tightening. So this is the percentage of large and medium sized banks that are tightening credit conditions. Again, these red areas of recessions and makes sense, right? Money's harder to get. It's, it's a drag on the economy and look at what demand. This is for commercial and industrial loans. Look at the demand here as well. Very recessionary look right here. And then of course, the yield curve, right? Inverted yield curve, people will tell you is the best recession indicator and it is inverted like we haven't seen maybe ever, right? So the two 10 year spread, two year interest rates are notably higher than 10 year interest rates. Three month interest rates are higher than 10 year interest rates. And this is the one the Fed says we should be looking at. And that is a recessionary signal if I ever saw one. As most people in our business do, we track the two year as a hint to where Fed funds are going to be. But this chart is, is telling in another way. So the white line is the Fed funds rates. The orange line is the yield on the two year treasury. So notice what happens when the two year drops below the Fed funds rate or what has happened historically, recession, 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 long before we knew there was a pandemic coming. Remember, late summer 2019, we turned negative. After being bullish for 10 years, we turned negative on the economy, negative on markets or defensive on markets, I should say. So folks, here we are now with a pretty good spread between Fed funds and the two year. This two year ramping up here, particularly this, this week, reflects the Fed's promise to raise again later in the year. But notice that we're still below, again, the Fed funds rate and what tends to happen when you've got this going on. Also notice what tends to happen is that the two year drops and then the Fed funds rate starts ratcheting down. These are rate cuts by the Fed. So the two year was a real good signal that something's about to happen negative for the economy and the Fed will be cutting interest rates. And that ultimately, even though this is moving back in this direction, which says things are heating up, ultimately this is a sign 
that rate cuts are coming. And yes, of course they're coming. In fact, the Fed forecasts rate cuts for 2024. But the thing that this is missing so far is one of these red shaded areas. And that's what we need to be concerned about, folks. Another thing we track closely is the move index. It tracks volatility on, on T-bill options. Since the tech bubble burst, a move index above 100 is something to pay attention to. The blue line is the S&P 500 down here below. So you can see these areas that I highlighted light up here, virtually without exception since the tech bubble have been problematic times or volatile times for the stock market. The fact that we're coming down right here is good news, um, but we're still above that 100 threshold and the stock market is you know, trying to fight its way back up. So there would be a positive or a negative correlation, I think, bet between a falling move index and a rising stock market. But as you can see, this is very volatile and very noisy, right? You could have got real excited about it right in here, right before the next leg down in you know, the worst recession since the Great Depression. So something we're paying attention to. Other similar things like the high yield spread have come out of danger territory. So there's either a lot of complacency right here or things are about to get better. And I th we're, in the, uh, we're in the former camp as we sit here today. And the Treasury Liquidity Index, the higher, the worser. So you can see we're up very much up here in dangerous territory that we don't get to very often. So lack of liquidity based on pricing of treasuries uh, suggests that that's a, you know, this could be a precarious spot for the stock market right here. And then lastly, just gonna uh, scroll through a few things that I've added here. And this is my own note, lots of talk about the still half trillion or so of excess consumer savings in the system. Folks who are bullish say, hey, there's still all this liquidity in there. You know, bullish, if you're bullish, the stock market market's not gonna go down, right? Because still a lot of spending power in the economy and we're not gonna have a recession, yada, yada. And I, I said here, the following is interesting. When you think about the groups who have the highest propensity to spend, the ones who really push their liquidity through the economy, they actually have less in savings than they did three years ago. Uh, at Morgan Stanley Bank conference yesterday, this is from Peter Bookbar, by the way, they're currently not pursuing new office commercial real estate originations, separately pointing out the stress that lower income and subprime borrowers are under. They said, and this is my bold, depositors with 720 plus FICO scores still have 25% more in their deposit balances in the bank than they did three years ago. However, Sub 720 borrowers have 5% less in savings than they did. Similarly, homeowners have 20% more, but renters have 20% less. So again, folks, it is just it just is what it is. The um, folks who have lower incomes and have to live space, paycheck to paycheck, just out of necessity, obviously, have a greater propensity to consume what they have, let's say. So that group who really are essential to the state of the economy or do not have the excess liquidity that a lot of people in the financial media and, and financial actors suggest that they would, at least according to this particular bank and what they see amid their depositors. Um, mentioned retail sales. So retail sales are given to us nominally, actually adjusted for inflation. Total retail sales do show an increase. However, core retail sales continue to fall on a real basis, meaning the core which X's out food and energy. When you apply inflation to that, they've actually declined a bit here. The trend and outlook is for weaker retail sales, according to Bloomberg here. So going forward, if you look at the trajectory, retail sales are gonna come down completely comports with our recession thesis. U.S. inflation still showing high breadth. This is interesting. So something like, call it 65% of the components in CPI are over 3% still. And call it 55% are still over 4% growth. And remember, we have a 2% inflation target. So the breadth of inflation, most things are still going up ahead of the Fed's 2% target. Used cars and trucks, for example, were up 4.4% in May. Interesting. Uh, car insurance was up a bunch in May. 
However, new cars, right, the blue line, new vehicles, were actually down in May, and that's showing us here as well. And this just says that uh, good news for auto repair and for insurance is that they tend to follow new car prices. So that inflation, according to this chart, will be coming off the boil. Um, and then we get, you know, the primary rent of residents continues to go up, rent, owner's equivalent rent, interesting metric, but that's what they use, continues to go up. Airfares, interestingly, are down 3%. That makes sense, I guess, if the consumer is about to slow down. Hospital services, necessities, let's say, those are going up in price. Adult home care going down and so forth. And we, and we talked about the NFIB small business survey. So folks, I think we can say there's mixed signals. But I think when you square it all up, certainly the way we do and we score it, we still have weak economic conditions to come, lower inflation to come, thinking about the equity market even the, and the commodities market as well. I don't know that recession is priced into a lot of things right here. So that makes this somewhat precarious. And then when we talk about inflation, though, and we want to think beyond what's left in the spare market, if anything, we have we think very, very strong structural inflation forces that is going to bring us to a higher long-term rate of inflation for decades to come. And frankly, and this is something we're looking forward to, that is a very, very investable thesis. We just need to get through the rest of, I'll say it again, whatever's left in the current bear market. I'll leave it there, folks. Thank you, as always, for watching and listening. Hope you have a wonderful weekend. Talk to you next week. Bye-bye.